Hi, I'm Meg Jordan with the California Institute of Integral Studies. Welcome to Conversations with Modern Day Philosophers. Today I'd like to introduce you to a panel of professors from CIIS. And first I'd like to introduce you to Professor Sean Kelly. Hello, Sean. And you'll be talking a lot about why students even choose CIIS to study philosophy. I'd also like to introduce you to Assistant Professor Jake Sherman, who's a professor of philosophy and religion, and you're going to solve for us a lot of world problems about <laughs> religion today. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. I'd also like to introduce you to Assistant Professor Elizabeth Allison, who has got an exciting journey ahead of her as she looks at religion and ecology in parts of the world. Thanks, Meg. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I want to just throw this out with an open-ended question right now. Why philosophy? Why in this day and age? Because after all, students are returning to school, looking at downturned economies, looking at career paths. Philosophy? Do they get jobs in philosophy? What does it prepare them for? Sean, perhaps you can start. Mm. Well, there's philosophy and there's philosophy. Uh, the way philosophy has traditionally been taught and offered in, in our uh, academic institutions for the last century at least, has proceeded in the direction of being progressively uh, less relevant to what's actually going on in the world. Uh, now traditionally of course philosophy is meant to ask the big questions. Uh, why are we here? How did we get here? Uh, what are the principles and values that guide our behavior and make life meaningful? Uh, but so much of philosophy has uh, like most academic uh, inquiry, has gotten progressively narrower and narrower and more abstract and disconnected from what's really going on. And by what's really going on, I mean uh, primarily uh, uh, the unparalleled planetary situation uh, that we're in at the moment. So philosophy at CIS is not just philosophy in, in the normal sense of the term. It's philosophy in relationship with religion, with science, with ecology, with politics, with spirituality. Um, so uh, there's philosophy and there's philosophy. So they come to CIS to study philosophy because it's not philosophy as usual. It's philosophy in the deeper sense of uh, uh, really uh, longing for opening up to wisdom, wisdom. Sophia. And the big questions, just as you said. And I've seen your students. They are like engaged activists in the world. They move forward with what they learn in your classroom. And they go out. And this, this, they grapple with questions that um, border on ecology as well. You've got a program there on integral ecology, right? All of you work with it as well? What is integral ecology all about? Well, uh, of course, the California Institute of Integral Studies, there's the word integral here, uh, which can mean many things. But the, the root meaning of integral uh, is uh, you might, we might uh, think of integral as wholeness, right? So uh, ecology already suggests a kind of wholeness. Uh, traditionally, ecology uh, is, is the study of the relationship of organisms to their wider environment. So, so it suggests wholeness in that way. But uh, scientific ecology being embedded in uh, uh, the modern scientific paradigm has tended to get more and more specialized, uh, more and more technical, and therefore, uh, paradoxically, not very holistic. So an integral approach to ecology, uh, first of all, follows the, the uh, spirit of ecology in, in being concerned about the environment and the holistic relationships uh, between living organisms and their environment. But it tries to do that in a more integral way, looking at the wider whole in which even ecology is embedded. So what is that wider whole? Well, the wider whole, again, is an unparalleled moment in planetary evolution in history. Uh, one, uh, literally, that has never occurred before uh, uh, and which has consequences for the whole planet unfolding in our moment. Yeah. So um, an integral ecology is one that, first of all, recognizes this unparalleled moment and uh, tries to summon the, the full spectrum of human potential. And this is another meaning of integral, the full spectrum of human potential. So not only the scientific, but the humanistic, the spiritual and brings this full spectrum of, of potentials to the question of our, uh, our moment, uh, planetary moment now. So. 
When you talk about this, Professor Kelly, I, I detect a certain urgency that the world needs to change, the world needs to transform, and perhaps we do this one person at a time through philosophical undertakings. This may be, you know, you have, you're attracting students now that have been steeped in the environmental movement, but you're opening them up to this wider ecology, the wider sense of what this is about. How does it intersect with religion, Jake? I, th I think part of the question is how how do comprehensive questions get dealt with? Right, so religions deal not just with any single aspect of a person's life, but they deal with the comprehensive, the totality of a person's life, how they live in relation to each other, how they live in relation to their place, how they live in relationship to whatever they think of as God or spirit, but also questions about how they live in relationship to their traditions, the things they've inherited, right, the past, which also continues to shape us in ways that I think too often we're not fully articulate about. So when we look at a global crisis of the proportion that we now face, we find ourselves confronted with something that's not a single, there's not a single place where the rot set in. There's a, there's an onslaught of crises that we need to deal with. And these, as Sean was mentioning, these deal with the totality of who we are. And religions are one of the few traditions of human thought that are actually, and human action that are actually oriented towards that kind of comprehensive reformation. And by that I, I mean actually reformation. Religions aim to transform their adepts and their aspirants and through a series of practices, rituals, liturgies that don't just shape a person's mind, they don't just shape a person's ethics, but they shape a person from the inside out, including the whole of their community. And so I think dealing or looking at the way that religion intersects with the global crisis is one of the ways, it's another of the ways that we can begin to look at what it means to be doing an integral engagement with things, right? Religion is already intended or is already, I should say, religion is already active in integrally engaging the whole of who a person is. And sometimes that, that's been for you know, tremendous ill as well, right? So religions aren't only involved in a kind of positive reshaping of the world. Sometimes they contribute to a lot of the problems we encounter. And so yes, when we so look I'm at- I'm thinking you're, you're have, right now, picture yourself being watched on YouTube by prospective students to CIS, and they've tuned in saying, wait, wait a minute, we live in a world where religion is at the heart of a lot of the hostilities that are being created. We see Taliban blowing the face off of ancient Buddhist statues. Right. So, oh, reconcile some of that for them. On the one hand, you wanna, you wanna ask about how is it that religion is, how is it that the resources of religion are deployed in these kind of activities, both for good and for ill. So learning to think about religion is a way of training ourselves to think about a whole approach to the world and to spirit, right? Then you want to ask also the question is how do, how do the symbolic machinery of religion get engaged in different ways? So how is it that suddenly religion can turn violent or destructive or rapacious? How is it that our attitudes towards the earth and our attitudes attitudes towards the other, how is it that these get shaped in extraordinarily negative ways to the traditions we've inherited? But learning to think about religion uh, in, a, in an engaged rather than a disengaged way helps us to tackle some of these questions. On the question of religious violence, for example, I think this one is, there's, there's a number of profound lessons we can learn from thinking about religious violence. And the first one I would, be, the first one I would want to ask or want to look at is, is to rephrase the question. Is it religion that's violent? Or is it rather that violence is always religious? Right? Uh, and, and what I mean by that is we tend to throw around, and, and you can find some popular uh, writers nowadays who will throw around the idea that there's something inherent in religion that's violence. And if we got rid of religion, suddenly we'd live in a sort of peaceable society. Plenty of editorials about that these days. Yeah. I'm not sure that that's actually, though, uh, the most accurate way to think about it. I think there is something in religion that can be used for violence regularly. And there's, there are religions that, as communities, marshal themselves for violent ends. But by thinking not only about religion from the outside, but also trying to learn to think what it means uh, to be religious, 
I think we can discern that there's an aspect of human behavior uh, that has a kind of passion to it, a kind of inner sacred quality that can be turned for very destructive ends. And that's what I mean by saying that it's not necessarily religion that's violent, but that violence is always religious. There's something in violence that a purely secular approach misses. Mm -hmm. And it's that element of the sublime, it's that element of the compelling and the liberatory that people feel in acts of violence. Why is it that there's a kind of catharsis mm -hmm. that seems to be associated with these acts of violence? And that's what, we can identify that as a kind of quasi-religious aspect of violent activity. Well, I want to bring us back a second to the, beyond the hostility, the passion that maybe sparks that and uses what you call this imagery and machinery of it, to this passion that also propels students to look at places like CIS saying, I don't want to just study the environmental movement, I want to go deep. I want to go into a deep ecology right now and help transform myself and the world and the planet and whatever else, the cosmos. Uh, Professor Allison, you're off to Kathmandu within the hour. <laughs> This is exciting. This is part of a three-year grant that you're doing, looking at the Himalayas, ecology, sacred traditions. You, you're passionate about this. How do you talk to students at CIS about this intersection of ecology and sacred traditions in the Himalayas? What students come to CIS because they're passionate about change in the world, because they're already activists, I think. And they want to know they want some philosophical framework for that because they often see that a lot of action without thought behind it is just like a chicken running around with its head cut off. They see that people get burned out in the environmental movement or in the social justice movement. Um, and they're looking for ways to sustain themselves and studying religion and philosophy helps them see or helps them elucidate what they already know that activism is inherent in many of our traditions um, and at the same time these traditions can sustain activists by connecting them with a, a wellspring, a source of life or energy, whether it's the divine, whether it's a spiritual practice, um, something that, that keeps people going. I mean myself, I was an environmental activist for many years. I mean I still am, but more on the activist side than on the theoretical side and I got really burned out and I started wondering mm -hmm why, what, what's going on and why do environmental organizations work their people to death or even grassroots activist movements just work, 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 work and then you just burn through a whole generation of activists and you get new ones. Well, what's, what's up with that? Um, and it was because these movements were not connected to their foundations in the divine or in the spirit or in some kind of tradition or ritual um, and so I started thinking about the resources that religion can bring to activism. And I started to notice that a lot of the um, older activists, retired people who were activists, were deeply motivated by their religion. And they went home and they read their Bible or they went to their, did their prayers or went to temple or whatever. And that gave them a continuing source of energy and strength to carry on their action in the world. So you see the usefulness of that. Yes. I wonder if it's, a, it's not like coming home to some kind of intrinsic spirit that sustains us for that kind of good. Uh, Professor Kelly, you wrote a book called Coming Home. What is the essence of that? Well, uh, I'd love to say something about that, but uh, if, if I may, just uh, add a little, a little too? coda to... Sure. Uh, to um, there's a movement, there's a new movement. Well, it's a new movement, it's not a new, uh, a new movement. It's a new, new word for uh, an old movement called, uh, but the word, the, one of the terms is spiritual activism. Uh, and as Elizabeth has uh, so um, eloquently described it, there are many people who are um, trying to make conscious links between their religious or spiritual traditions on the one hand and their activism in the world. Uh, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, for many of these people, they can avoid uh, the, the kind of burnout that Elizabeth was talking about. And they can be more effective change agents in the world when they have a spiritual foundation to sustain them. Uh, so, and there's another dimension to this, which is, uh, which one could call not only spiritual activism, but uh, subtle activism. Uh, in fact, uh, CIS uh, over the last couple of years has um, housed 
a center, the CIS Gaia Field Center for Subtle Activism, which people can tune into by going to GaiaField.net. Uh, now, the idea of subtle activism in contrast to spiritual activism is this. The traditional view is to see action in the world on one hand, on the one hand, and mind or consciousness or spirit on the other. Uh, and spiritual activism says that your action in the world will be more effective if you can draw from your spirit or your consciousness. That's a great idea. CIS is actually going one step further, and it's challenging the root assumption that action in the world and spirit or consciousness are two different things. And it's saying that, no, in fact, consciousness, mind, meaning, is action. Uh, and uh, some of the most potent action you can do is to make more conscious, to engage consciously in the world of meaning, of spirit and mind, which we're always in anyway. Right? There is no action which is not in some sense the embodiment of a value that is not informed by some sort of idea. Right? All action in the world, uh, even the most unconscious uh, action, is informed by some kind of world view, by some sort of value, and so on. And as uh, Elizabeth was saying, that the last thing we want in the world is, is action without consciousness. Uh, it's like a chicken the with its... Kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, um, it will not only burn out, but you, you just get mass destruction, or destruction on a mass scale when, when uh, large groups of people and uh, our leaders and politicians are, are, dr are driven to act uh, unconsciously and without being without engaging the realm of consciousness. So, people can come to CIS, and they do come to CIS, because they intuitively recognize, and now we are explicitly acknowledging the fact, that uh, as urgent as our world situation is, to take two years off of your life and come within this sacred precinct of, uh, of academe, which uh, CIS is, but it's, it's, it's uh, not like uh, other uh, academies. It's non-traditional it's, sense. It's non-traditional, uh, although, of course, it's fully accredited and it's, mm -hmm. and it's rigorous intellectually and so on. But uh, it's, it's a space where people can enter into a mindful, uh, fully embodied and engaged participation in this realm of meaning, of consciousness, of value. Uh, and uh, not only learn to understand how these values, these ideas, uh, impulses, have structured the whole history of the planet up into the present, but by engaging in them mindfully now, we are in fact engaging in a process of global transformation. It's not, it's not that we have to, uh, we don't have to wait to after uh, engaging in the ideas and then go out into the world. Engaging the ideas is a form of activism. So this is what we mean by subtle it's incredibly activism. Incredibly optimistic statement in a sense. I mean, there's a lot of despair out there. And that there kind is. of statement that that dialogue and that encounter with these big ideas held in this cauldron uh, of a classroom experience with the three of you can actually spark something in an individual. Yeah, well, of course, it's not just uh, the faculty, and this is one of the things that's so special about, uh, one of the many things that's so special about CIS is the community of students that are drawn to it. Uh, um, What's that like? Describe it. Well, I mean, I'll just, I'll just say a few words. I want to I hear from my two colleagues, but uh, if, I, if I may yeah. just say a couple of words about that. Uh, it, it is an unbelievable blessing uh, every day to show up uh, at this institute in class and see these this community of souls, each one uh, a star in, in a firmament uh, with their own unique uh, life path and destiny, which, however, ha have all come to this, uh, to this uh, center, almost like the white hole at the center of the Milky Way, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, the learning experience at CIS is not just a monologue of faculty giving the goods to the students. It's, it's not a download. No, it's mm -hmm. an encounter. It's a living encounter in a community of destiny mm -hmm. uh, where uh, there is a, a collective learning process going on all the time. It's deeply inspiring. Integral ecology, religion, spirit, activism as consciousness, consciousness as activism. These are lofty ideals. Uh, 
Are you un unique as a university in presenting these? I've been working on these ideas for 20 years now. But when I was in college, there wasn't anyone to talk to. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I studied religion and I also studied environmental studies. And my faculty mentor said, well, put them together as best you can. Fortunately, oh, 10 years later, I came across Mary Evelyn Tucker's book, a compilation of essays on, on Buddhism and ecology. And I saw that people were actually working on bringing these topics together. And I became inspired to continue my graduate studies so I could join the conversation. Um, but I, I believe that we are a little bit ahead of the curve. We are here on the edge of the country, on the edge of San Francisco, um, always looking across that Pacific Ocean. And I think that, um, yeah, that we're, we're a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, but more and more we're hearing in the popular discussions, especially about environmental issues, that we need to bring issues of spirit and consciousness and values into, into the discussion. Even at Yale, where I did my master's work, um, a few, just a few years ago, they brought together a group of 57 leaders of the environmental movement to say, what can we do? The situation is getting worse and worse. We're making policies. We're, we're trying to petition governments and so on, but we're really not getting anywhere. And that group of mainstream leaders came up with a report called A New Consciousness. And they came to the conclusion that we need a new consciousness. Well, right. here at CIS, we're, we're helping that. bring yeah. that into reality yeah. with our students. It's a, it's a firm recognition among the three of you and the students as well. I, I'm thinking of a, an early documentary about Ladakh, when you talk about Buddhism and, and natural instinct for ecology. And, and there was such a rush for modern life, uh, uh, just like a juggernaut into modernity at that point. And so much was lost in that um, kind of Buddhist respect for mind, body, spirit, nature, the blend of how to be a great steward on the earth. What are you going to be doing in this work in Kathmandu? Is some of that getting resurrected, yeah. or is it an American redefinition of what? No, most of the folks that I'll be meeting there are from the region, from the Himalayan region. And um, we're, it's about 30 people meeting to lay some groundwork for a three-year project on everyday religions. So the practice, not the, the high textual uh, tradition, but the practice of religion and how that shapes sustainable environments in the Himalayas. Um, so I think we're, these are all experts, of course, but I think we're going to be looking to the local people for what in their practices is sustainable, both in terms of the ecology and in terms of their spirit, you know, what sustains them in their daily life. Ah, interesting point. Yeah, you're talking to a medical anthropologist here, and I tend to make sure my students don't over-romanticize what Native cultures have. Absolutely. Because there is something that's happened here in the West, the flourishing of consciousness. And I think when we bring that back, there's this intermingling and a mutual support society that starts to happen, too. And we reawaken Native societies to some of that old instinct. And so there's, uh, I, I would think that you're bringing back, is what I'm saying, I, I'm putting a laurel on you, saying you're bringing quite a bit of this consciousness there as well. Let's yeah. see. Let's see. <laughs> good, good. Do you see what I'm talking about, though, at all? This blending of East, yeah. West, ancient, yes. modern, indigenous. Yes, for sure. And uh, the way the consciousness has moved forward. Sean, you talk about it a lot in your book, Coming Home. Mm. It seems like you've read this. the book. I'm, yeah, I'm honored. I, <laughs> do. I have it at bedside, and it's a great reader, I'll tell you. Oh, thank you. It gives me a lot of hope and optimism about the future. Mm. I'm glad to hear that yeah. uh, because I'm sure many people like myself um, oscillate between hope mm -hmm. and uh, despair, despair sometimes. It's hard not to feel despair uh, in moments. Um, the great, one of the great hopes, of course, is uh, a radical uncertainty. Uh, things have become so complex. I mean, of course, life is always uncertain. We, we may think we know uh, what's going to happen next, but we never do. Luckily, on a planetary scale, we also don't know what's going to happen. I mean, from one perspective, the prospects are very dire. We seem to have about a five to ten year window, uh, for instance, to get uh, um, some kind of handle on climate change, carbon emissions, loss of habitats, and so on. And, if we don't, then uh, the experts seem to agree that within 50 years, um, uh, more than half of all species on Earth will be extinct, for instance. Uh, and um, 
prospects are, it's, it's very grim. Yeah, grim. Yeah, very grim. However, because the situation is so complex, so far from equilibrium, we know by looking back at our evolutionary history that if you had gathered all of the experts together right before uh, life was about to emerge, for instance, what did we have? We had a planet that was basically, uh, had been molten rock for thousands of millions of years, a ball of molten rock. And then suddenly, life. There was no way to predict that life would emerge right before its emergence. Similarly, uh, before uh, uh, flowers emerged, or before the first mammals or the first humans emerged, there was no way to predict right before it would happen that it would happen. Professor Kelly, we've got oceans that have maybe a 35-year limit, global change, we've got to solve in about five years. I mean, a lot of what you called radical uncertainty afoot right now. Where do we go with this? Right, well, the first uh, thing that's essential is to not flinch in the face of this radical uncertainty. Uh, one of our natural evolutionary defenses, of course, is to go numb or dissociate when uh, the situation gets uh, that scary. So we see a lot of this going on now. Uh, it's a kind of self-soothing through getting lost in the media, addictions, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's a great temptation, given the urgency of our moment, to feel that we need to uh, do something. And of course, we do need to do something. Somebody might ask, well, how can we justify uh, going to graduate school and, and uh, uh, studying consciousness and philosophy and so on, given things are so uncertain? Well, our moment seems to be one where uh, the whole planet is folding in on itself in a kind of global singularity uh, where it is impossible to predict what's going to happen next. So the, the, the gravest predictions are that we have a five to ten year window to get a handle on some of the, the, the most serious problems, climate change, CO2 in the atmosphere, habitat loss, and so on. We need to come up with policy uh, in order to uh, address these issues. Um, the reality is we're not going to do that, however, unless we have people coming into the world who have paused long enough to allow the full richness and complexity of the situation to sink in. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, a two-year program, for instance, at CIS uh, and in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness, for those who feel called to such a thing, and not everybody feels called. You have to tune into your, your intuition and your, your soul purpose and, and see whether or not you are called. But for those who feel called, this is an opportunity to deepen into uh, oneself to the point which intersects with other selves and with the planet, the cosmos, the divine, if you're open to that, so that uh, we will be ready to recognize the opportunity when we leave uh, to contribute in unforeseeable ways. Are there signs of rising consciousness on the planet? Are there people who are deepening and reflecting and pausing? Everywhere. Everywhere there's signs. I think it depends on what kind of consciousness you're looking for. Certainly in the Bay Area we find ourselves in a conglomeration of people who find themselves motivated from the inside. Why to I make, here. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's why a lot of people migrate from all over the world mm -hmm. uh, to be to, in a place where they feel like there is an activity for envisioning new possibilities for the future. CIS has always been at that epicenter, whether it's the beat generation or the, the hippie generation or the dot-com generation or now the global and greening generation of California. We always seem to, to have that epicenter there, that nerve, that, that center. And so you've come back. You've been here and That's you've right. come back. That's uh, right. I mean, I, I came here initially for that very reason. I, I, been out doing my degrees elsewhere up and down the west coast uh, and I came to CIS because I felt like it would be a place that would help me to think about present realities, present demands and present calls while also keeping an eye on the people I need to all engage with if we're going to make a difference. I feel like CIS holds together two sides. It holds together a radical vision 
for possibility and for engaging that side of us that likes to dream and maybe feels a call to dream about a better possible future. On the other hand, we also have to engage with the realities of our moment, people who there are there are discourses that are already out there, there are politics that are already out there, there are institutions that are already out there, and we can't just dream and build some sort of little new dream world out of it. We need to learn to speak both of those languages in order to bring them together and to make fruitful, constructive change in the world. And I feel like that's the great genius of CIS, to be grounded in traditions and institutions of learning, but to also have open eyes looking forward and mm -hmm. seeking to prepare ourselves for what is to come. Right. You know, you're not just talking interdisciplinary stuff, you're talking transdisciplinary. And in fact, you were all putting your heads together on how to even come up with transdisciplinary programs that looks at sacred traditions, ecology, how to deepen our understanding. We have a track called Integral Ecology that Sean has spoken about. And we're also working on putting together a track that would be throughout the School of Consciousness and Transformation at CIS, so that it would include integrative health, in which you teach, and um, East-West psychology and social cultural, cultural anthropology. And students in any of those programs would be able to add an ecological focus to their studies, because we know that this is so important, and ecology affects every type of study and every type of practice that a person could do. So whether they're an anthropologist, they're going to be looking at how ecology affects the people they study with, or they're psychologists, they're going to look eco-psychology, how does the changing environmental condition affect people's mental health and their spiritual health, and how can people perhaps improve their interior health through engagement with the natural world or help others improve their uh, mental and spiritual health through engagement with the natural world. So it's going to cut across the curriculum and we're, we're developing that plan. What is your own personal ecology, personal self-care practice that keeps mm -hmm. your pilot lights lit, mm -hmm. keeps you walking into your classroom every day engaged and excited? Mm -hmm. I want to hear how you walk your talk. I'm almost embarrassed to admit it a little bit. My, I feel like my academic practice has almost always come out of my uh, spiritual uh, practice rather Why? than the other way around. Well, for me, I'm, I've been, I wasn't raised in a particular religious tradition, uh, but I found a very deep home in a contemplative branch of Christianity. And I found that that was, I found that practices like sitting in silent prayer uh, and certain ways of engaging in ritual and with texts were transforming not only what I thought about religion, but were transforming what I thought about the world. Uh, and I wanted to learn to think that and not just to believe that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, sure. uh, right? I didn't want to just have a kind of private, irrational faith uh, on the one hand and then a public face that engaged in the world. I wanted to be able to bring those two together. Uh, and for me, this has meant being involved in practices of interreligious dialogue, uh, being involved in practices of social justice uh, outside of what I do in the classroom, and it also contextualizes everything I do in the classroom. I think without necessarily trying to impose my particular faith practice on my students. A religious major, a religion major at uh, an Ivy League school who said I could not put in an academic paper, a 25-page scholarly paper, any personal reflections I had about religion. Uh -huh. They had to be quotes from what the experts said. Yeah. It was a, kind of that strict, old-fashioned, rigorous academic paper. CIS allows people, even uh, for a portion of the papers anyway, to put in their own embodied self-care, embodied practice reflections. I, I mean, it's unusual. <laughs> it's, it's, it is unusual, but it's also, we're coming to realize, not just here at CIS, but throughout our culture, that that can actually be a more critical way of proceeding. Mm. There's not some neutral ground out there that, that academics occupy so that they can then speak from this academic place of neutrality and everyone else occupies their positions of prejudice and, right? So at CIS, by, by teaching us to think from within the, from within our fully embodied spiritual, psychological, religious, traditional, and enlightenment selves. We bring the whole of who we are and we become self-reflective about it. 
which I believe helps us to have a much richer conversation as a whole, right? And maybe for the culture to have a much richer conversation, and one that doesn't, one that doesn't turn invisible the things that are really operative, the passions that are really operative in people's lives. Seems like this approach to integral education then uh, is so well aligned with your values, how you want to teach and how you want to live. It would be hard to operate without it, an integral approach. Yeah. Everyone observes from somewhere. So we might as well be honest about from where we're observing and who we are, who it is doing that observing. So for such a long time, science has played the God trick and said, we're, we're omniscient, we can look from above and see mm -hmm. everything that's going on and tell you the truth of the matter. But no one's omniscient. So we might as well say, this. I sit here in San Francisco as an assistant professor, as a woman, and this is what I can perceive. Mm -hmm. And that's what I encourage my students to do. I think we all do. To have that deep honesty mm -hmm. about how they've engaged with the material and who they are. Mm -hmm. and, how it, and, and like Jake said, how it affects, uh, affects them, affects us. The, there's a constant dialogue between the material and the self that's reviewing the material. And whether it's taking it in or disagreeing right. with it, but to try to, to describe what that engagement is like. I imagine you've witnessed many students go through a kind of an arc of transformation. And it's not always a series of little triumphs. There's got to be some troughs along the way. S grad students are notorious for going through divorces and this and separations and getting back together, losing half their friends, finding them again. Those arcs of transformation. How do you hold and support that at CIS? Mm. What kind of a uh, cauldron do you have for that? Well, you're, you're, you're use the term cauldron uh, very appropriately, we, we realize that uh, the Institute as a whole and our program, we intentionally try to hold in our imagination, in our hearts, the image of the program as a kind of alchemical ah. cauldron or right. retort. Of course, the alchemists were, were uh, uh, um, interested in facilitating the evolutionary process of matter in its transformation from base metals, uh, lead, into gold, which of course is a symbol of the, the tendency of, the, evolu of uh, the cosmos to become progressively more transparent to its inherently divine nature. This is the gold, the gold of, nice. uh, of the spirit. So um, the, the program, the two, uh, usually it's a two-year program for the master's program. I mean, it can take longer or in some, t in some cases a little bit shorter. It's a PhD program as well. But the, the program is like uh, a cauldron and, and, or the alchemical alembic or retort, that sort of vessel. It's, it's an alchemical vessel. So the program is a vessel. The community itself is a vessel. Mm -hmm. The mission of the institute and the program is also the vessel. And what's common to all of them is uh, an, an openness and a readiness to show up as Elizabeth and, and Jake were saying, to show up in our whole beings, um, uh, show up as who we are, knowing that we may not always know who we are, and that's all right. The important thing is to show up, uh, because uh, if, we, if we are not ready to acknowledge ourselves in our momentary lapses and shadow and brokenness, mm -hmm then uh, we won't be able to become who we truly are, which is essentially uh, a being evolving toward some kind of mysterious wholeness. So we hold that, that potential and that aspiration as the kind of soul of our program, and that's common throughout CIS. And students recognize that, and they, they enter into it with that in their hearts and minds. We're just going to wrap up right now. We want to thank all of our panelists today, and I hope you get to present your ideas in numerous ways to the world, and this will just be one of many. So thank you very much, Professor Sean Kelly, for all your contribution, and Professor Jake Sherman, and thank Professor you. Elizabeth Allison. Travel safe, be strong. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for listening to Modern Day Philosophers here at CIIS.